we've talked about several things lately. This is not really any kind of a series, but I do want to talk about the Holy Spirit tonight. Uh, he, he happens to be like the most important thing these days. He was the most important thing. Getting the Holy Spirit to the earth was the most important thing for thousands of years. Like when God uh, had to leave the Garden of Eden, uh, it, the whole goal was get back. You know, he had to leave the human race. Uh, and the whole goal was for him to get back to us, get, to back, get back to his people and put his spirit in so he could dwell inside of us. And so that's why it is important that Christians, those who believe in Jesus Christ, are not just, you know, sitting on their ticket waiting to get to heaven. You know, you bought your ticket for the picnic, you needed it, you took care of it, you knew that that was going to get you some food. Jesus has to be more than that. It just so happens that the Holy Spirit is, is a magnificent and, and tremendous uh, element of what Jesus purchased at the cross for us. Hallelujah. But he's so misunderstood. The Holy Spirit is so misunderstood, even though we believe in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they believe in the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and they got, they got all sorts of things said about the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Who is he? What does he do? What's he for? Uh, what can we expect from him? Because you got to know him. Uh, you and I need to know the Holy Spirit. He's your new friend. He's the replacement of Jesus. You don't get to sit around the campfire with Jesus Christ himself in the flesh, but you can sit around the campfire with the Holy Spirit. Amen. You got to know the Holy Spirit. You got to live. Jesus can't live with you at the house, but the Holy Spirit does. Jesus, I mean, technically, yes, Jesus is the Spirit, so he's in you, but he's invisible. So you got to get to know him because that's where everything is. All the blessing is in the Holy Spirit. The Spirit-filled life is the only life to live. Without living the spirit-filled life, you will be a dry and desperate Christian. And your life will look very much like the world, except you'll have to go to church on Sundays. There's got to be a bigger difference than us going to church on Sundays and Wednesdays, which we should do, and we do, but there's got to be something bigger than just what we do on certain hours of the week. And there is. The Holy Spirit changes everything. The Holy Spirit... Uh, sets us on our feet. Right. We've read so much. We know so much about the spirit, but let's just talk about some of those things tonight. Amen. Uh, Luke chapter four. Mm -hmm. Let's start here. Uh, this just shows how necessary the Holy Spirit is even for Jesus Christ. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Did I say uh, Luke four? Yes. Okay. Well, let's read Luke three twenty one. When all the people were baptized, it came to pass, Jesus also was baptized. This is in water. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, you're my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Now, Jesus himself began his ministry about 30 years of age. Stop there. So for 30 years, Jesus Christ, the son of God, born of a virgin, God in the flesh, Emmanuel, was here for 30 years without the Holy Spirit. This was the moment the Holy Spirit connected with Jesus Christ. And then Jesus began his miracle ministry. Even Jesus, the Son of God, needed the Holy Spirit before he had any supernatural type of a life at all. Up until this point, he was a Jewish boy fulfilling the law of Moses perfectly as all good Hebrews did. For 30 years, he was fulfilling the law of Moses perfectly, but did no miracle ministry until the Holy Spirit descended upon him. Then notice what happened. Verse four, uh, chapter four, verse one. Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. Notice he was filled with the Spirit and led by the Spirit. Then skip over to verse... Fourteen. Then Jesus returned after, the, after his uh, 40 days fasting. He returned in the power of the Spirit. 
to Galilee. So he left being filled with the Spirit, led into the wilderness. Then he returned in the power of the Spirit. I like to notice that because Jesus had to go hang out with the Holy Spirit. You and I need to hang out with the Holy Spirit or we won't have any power. So you don't have to do 40 days at a time. uh, But to get started, you might. You may not have to fast for 40 days, but you need to spend ample time getting to know the Holy Spirit. And then it should be a daily part or a weekly part or a lifestyle, getting to know the Holy Spirit, having fellowship with the Holy Spirit, right. having communion with the Holy Spirit. We mentioned this last week, yes. having, having a fellowship time with the Holy Spirit. What, 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 what are you talking about? Yes, reading your Bible, uh, knowing that the Holy Spirit is present to help you and talk to you and affirm things and remind you of things. He's going to remind you of all the things the Lord says. He's going to apply the things, all the Lord, the, everything that the Lord says. He's going to help you take scripture and understand it better. So just know that when you read your Bible, do it with the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, you've heard the sta- statement I've made from Smith Wigglesworth. He said, you know, some people like to read the Bible in the Hebrew and some people like to read the Bible in the Greek. He said, I, I prefer to read the Bible in the Holy Spirit. Right. Right. Let's not get all technical and educational about it. Let's read it in the Spirit so we can catch From the Spirit, the things of God. It's the Holy Spirit's job to impart to you the kingdom. If you don't hang out with the Holy Spirit, you won't understand kingdom life. Holy Spirit is necessary for us. That's praying in the Spirit, reading the Bible with the Spirit, following the Spirit, being led by the Spirit, obeying the Spirit when he prompts us. All those things go into that. Just wanted you to see that first, Jesus thought it was a big deal Uh, to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And that's why we emphasize it here. We also emphasize it, go to the book of Acts chapter 1, because Jesus said to, remember it's all about the Holy Spirit. Sure, it's about Jesus, and sure, um, there's lots more to it, but the Holy Spirit, without the Holy Spirit, you you won't get it. You won't partake of the covenant of God, you won't partake of the promises without the Holy Spirit. Some people are praying so hard about natural things changing in their life, and they have no concept of the Holy Spirit. They have no joy in the Holy Spirit. Like all their joy and all of their focus is on other things uh, rather than the Holy Spirit. Uh, Acts chapter 1, verse 4, being assembled together with them, Jesus, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you've heard from me. So he wants them to wait for the promise. What's the promise? (coughs) Holy Spirit is the promise. What's the great promise of God that that the Jews were waiting on, that Jesus alluded to, that Jesus said, don't you do anything until the promise was the Holy Spirit. Verse 8, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Praise the Lord. Look at Acts chapter 2. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Obviously, they were hungry and obedient. They wanted whatever Jesus said was coming. They stuck it out until he did come. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. We all need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 38. Then Peter said to them, repent. This is after his first sermon or the end of his first sermon. He says, repent. Let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What's the, what's the, the, the end result of this thing? Repent, get baptized in the name of Jesus. You notice he didn't say, and you'll be saved, even though that's part of it. He referred to, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Now... The moment somebody believes in Jesus and receives him, their spirit, man, it becomes alive unto God. And we're born again the moment we believe in Jesus and express out of our mouth, he is Lord. We're born again. So we could say there's a a sense of the Holy Spirit. The Bible calls it the seal of the Holy Spirit. We could call it the inward witness of the Holy Spirit. But to really follow the Bible, 
we have to also receive the Holy Spirit. And so obviously Jesus uh, of Nazareth, he was God, so he had some sort of, his spirit man was alive unto God, right? He was already born again, but he didn't have the spirit upon him. Same thing with many Christians. that We can be born again without having the spirit upon us and without having this dynamic life with the Holy Ghost. And so that's why we preach him around here. We want everybody saved, yes. We want everybody filled with the Spirit, yes. We want everybody to partake of all kingdom truth. We're not trying to pressure people to speak in tongues uh, or be filled with the Spirit or have signs and wonders or joy in their life, but it sure does help. Amen. Amen. So we're not, we're not trying to force it. We're trying to help make it easy for people to take one step of faith into the, into the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then speak with it. Because it does take some faith. It takes one little ounce of faith to move your tongue. And sometimes the mind gets in the middle of it and says, whoa, 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 don't understand, don't understand, don't understand. Nobody understands. You just have to have faith that what he said was, was true. You have to have faith in Jesus. He said, if you believe in, in my name, those who believe will speak with tongues. You better get to speaking. So the way we do things by faith is we do it because the Bible said. And then you have some people that can help you take a step of faith if it was hard on you. Now, some people, it's not very hard. Some people, they hear about it like you. Didn't you just ask the Lord and got started speaking in tongues by yourself? Where were you when you did it? In the living room. In the, the very first time, she just said, okay. And then it just came. Praise God. The other half of us are kind of jealous. <laughs> we had to get somebody to lay hands. We had to take a step of faith. We had to... In the old day, you know, you'd have 15 hands laying on you, <laughs> screaming and yelling and let go and let loose and, receive. you know, receive. So, say, say Coca-Cola. Just say, say, say Coca-Cola. Say, say Kawasaki. Say, she came on a Honda, he left on a Kawasaki. Just say something. <laughs> Just to get the tongue going. And people are like, oh, you can't do that. Well, you know, the reason that we do something is to get people to take a step of faith. And we know that odd syllables sometimes helps you break through. So, yes, I agree that, you know, we wish we didn't have to do that. But, you know, humans are stubborn, man. And sometimes our, our rationale and our, our big fat brain is just such a big wall to the things of God. And especially to the Holy Spirit. We're like too smart for him. And so we, we try to go through this life so smart up here and we miss the glory of the Holy Spirit. So you got to take a step of faith, start get filled with the Holy Spirit, speak in some tongues, Come have on. a prayer language. And then all of a sudden now, now I got to start learning how to follow him. How does he lead me? How does he speak to me? How does he, how does he give me an unction? How does he tug me? How does he stop me? How does he alert me? How does he love me? How does he bless me? How does he uh, help me? He's my helper. How does he help me? It's a lifetime of learning how to walk with him. Listen, listen, God loves this. God loves it. You need to recognize, well, it's so hard, I don't understand. What are they talking about? It's invisible. God loves this stuff. He just loves it when, some, when, when one person says, you know, God, I'm going to trust you as my partner who I can't see. Right. He loves that. In this earth life, in this church age, in this time and era, yeah. he is not physically here. And he needs you to believe. He wants you to believe. He is so pleased when those that come to him believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. So this faith life is now. He loves it when people walk by faith. So you got to be, you got to be okay with that. You got to get into it. You got to care about it. You can't just live a natural American life going through all of the rigor of modern day civilization living. You can't just do that. And then, and then, oh God, I need help with this thing I got going and this thing and I need help with this thing. It's got to be more than that. Yeah. Or we could just say, hey, man, God, God is more pleased when you spend a little time with the Holy Spirit. God called it seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You seek kingdom of God. You go after him, his kingdom, this invisible kingdom that's within you. You go after that and all the other things are added to you. Right. You, go, you go after the other things, you'll miss both. That's right. That's right. And anything you do get won't have the glory of God on it. The spark of heaven just won't be there. And so, yeah, you might have a, a pile of some rubbish, but 
it'll mean very little. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. He needs us. He wants us. He loves it when we go in there and have a spiritual life with him. So the spirit-filled life um, is very important. Matter of fact, the Holy Spirit will help you live the life of faith. He'll, he'll impart to you the spirit of faith. Oh, that's good. The Holy Spirit good. imparts to us right. the spirit of faith. So all of your learning, all the things we teach in here, it's not just the teaching and the memorization of anything. It's that the Holy Spirit will impart to you how this works. Right. He will impart to you that the spirit of faith is believing and speaking. The Holy Spirit is there to help you say the right thing at the right time. Uh, the same spirit that uh, helps you speak in tongues will also help you hold your tongue. Yes. Oh, that's good. So he'll help you, he'll help you walk in love. Yes. So the more full of the Holy Spirit you are, the more you walk in love. Because the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit, which is given to us. Amen. Does any of you know Christians who don't have a whole lot of love of God in them? Are they still Christian? I guess so, but it sure don't look like it. What's the problem? They're not full of the Holy Spirit. The first evidence of being full of the Holy Spirit, uh, we could say is speaking in tongues. The second evidence is that you walk in love. So you stay full of the Holy Spirit and you'll, you'll pray in tongues a lot and you'll walk in love with your fellow man. So you can't really do things well without the Holy Spirit. Uh, and we know that the spirit of faith will make a tadpole slap a whale. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Brother Mark Hankins, he makes sure that we remember that, that tadpoles slap whales when they're full of the Holy Ghost. <laughs> spirit of faith will make you charge hell with a water pistol. And so that's why spirit-filled Christians seem to be a little more confident, a little more bold, sometimes too confident. I mean, the spirit of faith is so powerful it, it'll get you out in a place really you shouldn't be. So with all the power that you got, all the boldness and courage that you got, you also need to have the leading of the Lord so that you don't jump out there ahead of things. The non-spirit-filled Christians don't have as many problems as the spirit-filled Christians. <laughs> I mean problems with uh, uh, how church goes and all that. I mean, I mean non-spirit-filled churches, I mean, they just... Nobody does anything. Nobody says anything. Nobody feels confident enough to stand up and testify or prophesy or give a tongue or a prophecy or anything. It's a lot easier. Let the guy with the seminary degree do everything. See, in, in non-spirit-filled places, they go to seminary and then they enter the profession of being a preacher. So everybody else, they're like, well, I didn't go to seminary. I know I can't do that. I'm not supposed to do that. But when you get filled with the Spirit, everybody thinks they can do that. <laughs> Spirit-filled people have more problems than non-Spirit-filled. Spirit-filled churches have more issues to deal with than non-Spirit-filled. Because we get filled with the Spirit, man, I can, I can get, get people saved. I don't even need a microphone. All Spirit-filled people can lead others to Jesus, heal the sick, cast devils out, do all the works of Jesus. I mean, your position in the body of Christ so that's where you have to follow the spirit to find your position in the body of Christ. So you don't just get to jump out with ambition and say, I can do that. And I want to do that. No, you don't do it that way. You follow the Holy spirit. So with this becomes me and the Holy spirit maneuvering my way into the body of Christ to serve the Lord forever and ever. Uh, of course we know that the spirit of faith will make you, Swing out over hell on a corn stalk and spit in the devil's eye. So we're not afraid of the devil. The, uh, the Holy Spirit helps you not feel condemned. You're not supposed to feel condemned because Jesus paid for your sins and your condemnation. You should confess your sins and be honest with God when you've blown it. The Holy Spirit will make sure that you don't feel condemned. The, the Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. 
So listen very closely. If you live a flesh life, you'll also live with guilt. If you get close to the Holy Spirit and walk with the Spirit, there's no condemnation and you won't sense any condemnation. God doesn't condemn anybody. It's the devil and you that condemn. We condemn ourselves. The devil condemns us. God's not condemning. He's done with that. He sent Jesus to the cross so he didn't have to condemn anybody. All right, go to Acts chapter 9. We'll read the scripture from last week. Uh, let me say this one also. With the Holy Spirit, living a spirit-filled, Holy Spirit-filled life, a life with the Holy Ghost. Now, I, I usually don't use the term Holy Ghost. Have you ever noticed that? How many of you like the term Holy Ghost better than Holy Spirit? No one? I, I like the term Holy Ghost better, uh, but I feel like the word ghost is just not quite used properly these days, and so I say spirit. And then when we, when we try to get really uh, fancy, we say Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, yes, the Holy Spirit. <laughs> so you use the Holy Ghost when you're preaching. You use Holy Spirit when you're teaching. If you really want to get special and mystical, Holy Spirit. <laughs> Why did I get off on that? Where was I? Maybe I just better go read the Bible. <laughs> Acts chapter 9, verse 31. Uh, this is after uh, Paul gets converted. Saul gets converted to Paul, gets saved. Verse 31, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace and were edified. And walking in the fear of the Lord... And in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. You and I need to uh, get familiar with the comfort of the Holy Spirit. All right, we talked about that last week a bit. Uh, but one, one arena that the Holy Spirit comforts us in is in the truth. The more full of the Holy Spirit are, you are, the, the more you side with truth, understand what is truth and what isn't. Remember, Jesus said, when the Spirit has come, he will guide you into all truth. You'll find that Spirit-filled people are more easily guided into all truth if they stick with the truth. If they get familiar with the Word of God, they'll, they'll, understand, they'll comprehend things just a little bit quicker, maybe a little bit better, hopefully. But you have the potential. So if you hang out with the Holy Spirit and you have a Spirit-filled life, you will be protected from the lies of the enemy for yourself, Praise from God. society, yes. from the push of the devil, Thank the ruler you. of the world, you, all that worldly that stuff, you'll, you'll feel safe from it. That's right. You'll hear something, you'll be like, well, that's stupid, that's wrong. Well, that's wrong. I mean, you could turn on the TV and Come you can, spirit-filled people can dissect every single thing that's right and wrong. Yep. Now, you're not all shaken by it, you're not supposed to complain about it and be all fretting about it, but you can certainly know. Then we can put you in church, and, and spirit-filled people can detect false doctrine from right doctrine. Right. right. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. And new Christians need to know that, that you're, you're protected, okay? You're protected by the Holy Spirit from false doctrine. What that means is if you'll get familiar real quickly with how he feels on the inside, how he witnesses to you, then when you hear a wrong thing taught, the red light will go on, and, you, and you'll go, oh, I don't I think that's right, but I'm not sure. Is everybody praising God about it or is everyone? I'm just going to put that on the shelf. The Holy Spirit helps you put it on the shelf. Uh, and then later, maybe you take it down and analyze it or you find some other facts or you hear some other witnesses about it and either you throw it away eventually or you go ahead and say, wait a second, I was uh, alerted to this that it might be wrong, but it turns out here's another scripture that at the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word is established. So sometimes like tongues, uh, tongues have passed away. I heard that from my mom years ago. Tongues have passed away. This church believes in tongues. Okay, fine. If that's you, you put it on the shelf. Fine, put it on the shelf. Uh, don't leave, 
Because next week you'll hear another scripture and another scripture that might help you take it off the shelf and put it into your life. So you do have to be honest with your shelving. We could also say that any one hour in here, I might open doors that, that I don't get to close. I might have to breach, uh, breach a, sh a subject that I don't get to fully, you know, teach through. And so you have to be okay with that and recognize, you know, well, I don't know about that. It didn't sound perfect. Well, it maybe it didn't come out perfect. So just hang in there till next month and maybe we'll redo it again. But the Holy Spirit will help you recognize where, where you can sit and where you can't, where you should sit and where you shouldn't sit. I used to go in my, in my first church, my first two or three years, I had to search for one spirit filled church. Then I found it and then it closed eventually. And I had to find a second. And so the way that I decided where to go to church is I, I, I was led by the Holy spirit. I wanted to make sure I was just simply following the Holy spirit. But my one confirmation that I wanted, I would go to their bookstore and usually it wasn't a big bookstore. It might've been a table. It, it could have been a one glass case, it was, or sometimes it was in a little room and I would go in there. I want to see what y'all are selling. This is before they had the internet, way back in the ancient days. This is before you could get online and watch everything that they've said. So the way that I detected, is this a safe place? I'd go look at their bookstore to see, see what kind of beliefs they had. But the primary way was the Holy Spirit let me know comfort here or not. Amen. Okay. Acts chapter 10. This is Peter and the first Gentile, not this non-Jewish family gets saved and filled with the spirit. All right. The first uh, non-Jew to get saved was the Ethiopian. The, the first non-Jewish family to get saved and filled with the spirit is this Italian family. Acts chapter 10, verse 1, there was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of what is, what, of what is called, what was called the Italian regiment. The Italians, first ones, first non-Jews to get the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> verse 2, a devout man and one who feared God with all his household, who gave alms generously to the people and prayed to God always. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, what is it, Lord? See, he said to him, your prayers and your alms have come up for a memorial before God. <clears throat> you know, your giving can get God's attention. Wow. Wow. Your prayers can get his attention, sure. Notice he, he, he was a devout man, one who feared God. The fear of the Lord will get the Lord's attention. Verse 5, now send men to Joppa and send for Simon, whose surname is Peter. He's lodging with Simon a tanner whose house is by the sea. He'll tell you what you must do. That's amazing. Here the Lord is talking. Here the angel is talking. The angel's talking. Why didn't he just tell him? It's always amazing that God wants you to take one step before you get the next. He wants you to uh, obey one instruction before you get the next instruction. We, we sit there and say, oh, just tell me the whole plan, God. Oh, I'm, that's so uncomfortable to make me do that. What's going to be the outcome? You're going to have to do it the Lord's way. Okay, so then the angel who's, okay, well, let me skip down here. Uh, we'll skip Peter's deal. Peter was going to go, uh, he was praying and fasting. He was going to eat, but he fell into a trance and the Lord spoke to him. Verse 13. Oh no, I better read this whole thing. Verse 9. The next day as they went on their journey and drew near the city, Peter went up on the housetop to pray about the sixth hour. And then he became hungry and wanted to eat became very hungry and wanted to eat. But while they made ready, he fell into a trance and saw heaven opened and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. A voice came to him, rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean. Now stop there for just a second. If, if you know anything about the Old Testament, the Jews were commanded through the law of Moses to only eat certain types of foods and not eat other certain types of foods. The others were called unclean. You were not supposed to eat those. Anything that didn't chew the cud and have a cloven hoof, you weren't supposed to eat. So you could eat a cow, but you couldn't eat a pig because the pig had a cloven hoof, but didn't chew the cud. 
Okay, there's your Old Testament lesson if you just want to know. And if you don't know what chew the cud is, you have to look it up on the internet. Okay. It means they didn't have two stomachs. Anyway, <clears throat> that's more information than any of us need. And here's why. I mean, you couldn't eat catfish either. You couldn't eat uh, shellfish. You couldn't eat because those are scavengers. Nothing that was a scavenger where, we, where you're supposed to eat was called unclean. But now you can eat your oysters and your shrimp. And your catfish and your shark. Those were all illegal. Yes, and bacon. Don't forget the bacon. Sharks better than catfish. Anyway, okay. Amen. <clears throat> Here's why. Because God changed things. And a voice spoke with him again the second time. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. So here you have to understand that it's, it's li- he's talking literal. He showed him a vision. So literally, God has cleansed catfish and shrimp. Hallelujah. Southerners, we like that one. <laughs> There's also a figurative application here. Most, most scriptures have a literal and a, and a figurative, or many do. Uh, This was done three times, verse 16. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Why was it done three times? Why did did he have to tell us it was done three times? Why did he have to have a vision at all? Why couldn't God have just said, hey, man, you can eat anything now? Why did he have to have a vision? Then it had to happen three times. Well, because every word is established by two or three witnesses. This is the way God does things. He, 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 he's just, he's interesting. God's interesting like this. And he's solid like this. Praise God. And I would encourage you in your life to use that principle in your life. Amen. Use the two or three witness Amen. principle for especially all spiritual things, but also natural things. Right. Listen, if you go do a research or a Google search online for something, go look for two or three good sources before you run off tooting the horn. It's it's a wise way to live. God started this. Let's follow the way God does it. Now, while Peter wondered within himself that what this vision he had seen meant, behold, the men who had been sent to Cornelius had made inquiry for Simon, stood before the gate. They called and asked whether Simon... Verse 19, while Peter, Peter thought about the vision, the Spirit said to him... Behold, three men are seeking you. Arise, therefore, go down and with them, doubting nothing, for I have sent them. Notice the Spirit said this to him. Okay, verse 24. And the following day they entered Caesarea, and now Cornelius was waiting for them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, a bunch of Italians, a whole bunch of Italians. The first mobster family. No, just kidding. Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped him. Peter Peter lifted him up saying, stand up, I myself also am a man. And he talked with him. He went in and found many who came together. And he said to them, "You you know how unlawful it is for a Jewish man to keep company with or go... To, the, to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. Apparently, Peter got the revelation. In the Old Testament, under the law of Moses, non-Jewish people were called unclean, and no Jew could eat with a Gentile. No Jewish person could sit at the table and eat with a non-Jew. God was showing the distinction between clean and unclean, holy and unholy. verse 29 therefore I came without objection as soon as I was sent for I asked then for what reason have you sent for me Cornelius said four days ago I was fasting so he tells him his story verse 34 then Peter opened his mouth and finally said something good no Peter opened his mouth and said in truth I perceive that God shows no partiality so this is like listen listen this is a huge revelation For the Jewish believers in Christ, the disciples, the first ones to believe in Jesus, the Savior, the Messiah who came for them alone. This is the big revelation. 
Peter the apostle says, I perceive something. Because of the vision, I perceive God is no more respecter of persons. God shows no partiality anymore. All of a sudden, the whole wide world is loved by him. All of a sudden, the gospel of salvation is sent to the whole wide world. And there's no distinction between Jew or Gentile. So this is, this is huge. Like right now at this point, Peter is the only apostle to know this. He's the only one to know this. Everybody else is thinking just Jews are the family of God. Only the Jews are loved by God. Because, you know, well, let me, let me, just, let me just keep reading here. In truth, I perceive God shows no partiality or he's no respecter of persons, King James. Verse 35, but in every nation, whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. The word which, that just means uh, God's going to get this gospel to everybody that's looking for him. The word which God sent to the children of Israel, preaching peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Uh, And then he preaches this great sermon. We got verse 38 in there, which we've read many times lately. Uh, verse, let's skip down here to verse 43 to him, all the prophets witness that through his name, whoever believes in him will receive remission of sins. Verse 44, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy spirit fell on all those who heard the word. What do you mean? He fell on them. Verse 45, and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. So the Jews, the circumcision was the Jews. Those Jews were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. They were astonished. Unclean people that they had lived their life thinking Gentiles were off limits to all Jews and all people of God. Astonished. The gift of the Holy Spirit was upon them. How'd they know? Verse 46, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Glory, glory, glory. That's how we know for sure somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit. They speak with tongues and magnify God. Glory. And that's why we work with people until that happens to them. That's right. That's right. Now it's interesting, this is one of those automatic ones like you almost like you, not, not quite. It's like they didn't, even, they didn't even come up to the altar and give their life to Jesus first. Right. They didn't get dunked in water first. They were so hungry and, and believed so strongly they got it all at once. Got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke in tongues all at once. And it was such a startling moment. They're like, what do we do with them? Looks like they got, what do we do with them? Look what Peter says here. Verse 47, can anyone forbid water that they, these should not be baptized in water who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord and they asked him to stay a few days. So they, they got baptized in water after they got filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no real order to the baptism in water part. And apparently there's no order to the saved and filled with the Holy Spirit part. It all happened at the same time. And if it didn't happen when you got saved, then it can happen subsequently because a lot of times that happened. Uh, Two or three times that happened after they got saved and baptized in water, somebody laid hands and they got filled with the Spirit. Just wanted you to see some of that terminology, but I also wanted you to see this whole Gentile Jew thing because here's why. In the Old Testament, it was all about Israel, all about Jews, all about the law, all about let's try to do all these things, try to do all these things, try to do all these things. Uh, and then the Holy Spirit came and fell upon people, and it's like, let me compare the Holy Spirit to all those things. Let me compare the, the life with the Holy Spirit, God himself living in me and on me. Let me compare that to blowing a shofar. Let me compare this to trying to keep a feast and eat the right foods at the feast. Let me compare this life empowered by the Holy Spirit to trying to toy around with something from the Old Testament. So you have to understand that the apostles were so enamored with the power of the Holy Spirit and God himself living in us. And we should be too. But anyway, let me, let me show you another one. <clears throat> Acts chapter 11. 
Verse 1, now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had received the word of God. And when Peter came up to Jerusalem, those of the circumcision contended with him. That means Jews, Peter came to Jerusalem, the Jews, those of the circumcision, contended with him. You went into uncircumcised men and ate with them. Listen, this is a big deal. Circumcision was the covenant people. Like it wasn't just being Jewish that gave you covenant with God. It was getting circumcised as a Jew gave you covenant with God. And without that, there was no blessing. So being circumcised was the, the all in to all for, for the Jews. But Peter explained it to him in order from the beginning, saying, I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. And this is Peter the apostle having to explain himself. Because this is a big deal. It's a big controversy. And then he explained, when I observed it intently, I saw four-footed animals. Verse 7, I, I heard a voice saying, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And verse 9, what God has cleansed, you must not call. This happened three times. And this, verse 12, the Spirit told me. So he's recounting the whole story. Verse 15, and as I began to speak, so these Italians, the Holy Spirit fell up upon them as upon us at the beginning. And then I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John must be baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. If therefore God gave them the same gift as he gave us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could withstand God? I mean, it's like the Jews, they kind of want to withstand God. The Jews kind of want to say this ain't right, but who is he to withstand God? When they heard these things, they became silent <laughs> and they, they glorified God saying, then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Hey. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. This is a big deal to them and we need to feel the magnitude that God has opened up salvation and the Holy Spirit to the whole wide world. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Isn't that exciting? Amen. Uh, go to Ephesians chapter 2. Now, this, this is why, this is why, and, and I'm, I'm going to do a, a few minutes on this. Boy, I'm going to run out of time. I'm going to do a few minutes on this because, especially for new Christians, you're going to run into some things that you hear from people, and it disturbs Christians. I mean, sometimes they get lured away. Uh, into false doctrine, into false tradition, false activity. Um, and so I wanted you to feel how the early church was feeling. They were going through this. This whole idea of circumcision versus uncircumcision was a huge deal. Circumcision was the primary command of the old covenant. Then they had all these laws to follow after they got circumcised. Uh, Ephesians chapter two, uh, just kind of, substantiates Jews and Gentiles being the same. Ephesians chapter two, verse 14, for he himself is our peace, or, or verse 13, but now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That's us. Uh, or, or let's read verse 11, I'm sorry. Read, read verse 11. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called uncircumcision, by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. That was us. The Jews had hope. They knew Messiah was coming. We didn't have any hope. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Glory. How near? Really, really near. For he himself, Jesus, is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. He's talking about broken down the wall between Jews and Gentiles. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is the law of commands, the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace. And that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby, thereby putting to death the enmity. There is no enmity between non-Jews and Jews. 
Or let's say it this way. There is no enmity between those who are in Christ, no matter what your race is. This is where he took down the wall so no Jew who believes in Jesus has to think less of any Christian who believes in Jesus. This is a big deal. Uh, There's a couple other scriptures I wanted to read. Go to, or I'll just quote this one. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, By one spirit we're all baptized into one body. Whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free and have been made all, drink, all to drink into one spirit. Galatians 3.28 says, it's, let's turn there, Galatians 3.28. Galatians 3.28. I'll quote one, Romans 10.12 says, there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek or Gentile for the same Lord over all is rich to all that call upon him. So there's no difference between the Jew and the Gentile that believes in Jesus. Everybody okay with that? Galatians 3, verse 28. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And if you are Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. So you need to understand this, that there is no extra honor given to Jews. Uh, and you'll hear these things throughout your Christianity. You'll hear groups, you'll hear people, you'll hear somebody challenging you or somebody heading off to learn something Jewish because they think it's better to, to add some things. Uh, but I'm here to tell you, you don't have to do that. Isn't that exciting? Yes, Why? Because the Holy Spirit changes everything. The Holy Spirit replaces everything. Amen. The reason that we don't need all that old stuff is because Christ ended the law for righteousness. We don't have to keep any parts of the ceremonial law that the Jews did because Christ ended it. Romans 10, 4, Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Put that up there. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Somebody's thinking of Matthew 18. Somebody's thinking of Matthew 5, I mean, Matthew 5, 18. Um, which says, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or one tittle of the law will be destroyed or be done away G- until all is fulfilled. Remember that? Matthew five eighteen. Till all is fulfilled. Some people say, yeah, but see, uh, he didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. Yes, he did. But then he ended it. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. Not the morality of the law, If you find any good moral uh, command in there, we still keep those. We just don't keep any of the ceremonial laws. Um, Think of it this way. Okay, in the Old Testament, they had the Holy of Holies. They had the high priest who could go in and meet with the Holy Spirit once a year, make propitiation for the sins of the people. After sacrificing, after cleansing, he'd go in there, and hopefully he was clean enough so he didn't have to die. Because if sin gets too close to the Holy Spirit, sin dies. And that's why, you know, the tradition tells us that they would put the palm granite and a bell on his robe in case he wasn't holy, he would fall down dead, but they couldn't go get him because no unclean person could go in and get him. So they would tie a rope to him and just pull him out. Oh, I don't hear any more bells and palm granites clanging. He, he, he must not have cleansed himself well enough, so let's just pull him out and start over. Any takers, any, any extra high priest we got? We got any extra? <laughs> the, the point was he had to go in there and meet with the Holy Spirit because that's the only place the Holy Spirit could meet is on the Ark of the Covenant between the two cherubims on the mercy seat. And, and then the scripture in Hebrews says that while the first tabernacle was standing, the way into the holiest place was not made manifest. Like there was no way for everybody else to get close to the Holy Spirit. There was no way into the holy presence of God while the first tabernacle was still standing. There was no way into the presence of God for all Old Testament people, 
All the circumcised people. No, there was no way for them to get close to the Holy Spirit. Wow. The whole search for everything was the Holy Spirit, the presence of God. No one had the Holy Spirit presence. While the first tabernacle was still standing, there was no way in. Wow. Except for that one high priest, and that was questionable. And that's why Jesus is called the way. I'm the way. Thank you, Jesus. The truth and the life. Jesus glory. is the way into the holy place. Glory, glory. Thank you. Jesus is the way into God's holy presence. Once you have God's holy presence, you don't need the calendar or the candles or the tallits or the tittles of the Jewish ceremonial law that Jesus fulfilled and ended. So when somebody wants to wear Jewish garb thinking that's better, then they want to teach you, oh yes, this is where they, the tent that he spoke of was where they pulled this over and prayed. And so this is how we pray. You're discrediting Jesus Christ and all that he gave us. When you go backwards, you're discrediting, devaluing Jesus Christ. Paul said, and Christ will profit you nothing. This is the way Paul said it. He said, if you who are saved want to be circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. If you get saved by Jesus and then decide you need to go back and get circumcised in order to be a better Christian or something, Christ profits you nothing. I would say it this way. If God commanded us away from the most important part of the old covenant, which is circumcision, if he commanded us away from that, why add any lesser command at all? Why try to find out anything about any Jewish feast at all? It's a waste of of Christian time. It's a waste of Christian money. It's a waste of your faith. Matter of fact, it will subvert your faith. It will harm your faith more than help your faith. If you pull out a shofar to get something accomplished by God, it will hurt your faith more than help it. It'll make your ears feel good. It'll make you have goosebumps because it sounds so marvelous. It will hurt your faith. You're now placing your faith on something that's false. Jesus removed their religion that they were standing on. He took it out of the way. The Bible says that he takes away the first that he can establish the second. He took the, Jesus took the first covenant away from them. So they wouldn't be standing on anything that was false. I say we need to do the same. Make sure we take the old covenant away from people. Give me that shofar. It's pretty. We'll hang it on the wall, okay? Can we hang it on the wall? We'll blow it at the football games. When we win, we'll blow the shofar at the football games. We'll put, it on, we'll put it in the band and let them be part of the band. That's fine. That's fine. It's not the blowing of it that's wrong. It's the purpose behind blowing it. I can feel I'm, I'm standing on people's favorites. Listen, here, here's why people do it. Good, good well-meaning Christians uh, go backward when they shouldn't, because the natural things are easier to see and experience and delight thyself in. The pretty golden menorahs, anything I can see and touch, national affairs, those are easier. Holy Spirit's not as easy because he's spiritual, but he's the glory of God. Everything we do with the Holy Spirit is where we, we touch the glory of God. It doesn't matter how pretty your, your little holy of holy replica is. And I've tried to tell ministers this. Listen, if you do a teaching where you construct the old holy of holy place with the Ark of the Covenant and the, the showbread and, the, and Aaron's rod that budded and put the golden cherubims there and the blue curtain around and you do all the things that they were commanded to do to build the tabernacle. If you do that for a teaching and try to show the symbology of what all of those artifacts mean, that's fine, that's fine. Just don't leave that thing standing in the church. Like after the teaching's over, go ahead and, go ahead and get that out of there, or it'll distract people into thinking there's some special presence of God upon there. No, he left. 
Holy Spirit left that place. He was so happy to leave that place. The veil rent from top to bottom. Holy Spirit said, woohoo. I mean, I met, the Bible doesn't say that I'm making that up, but think about it. Think about it. God finally paid for sin and got to live inside us and clothe us with himself. It's got to be way better than all of those artifacts. Not even God left the old tabernacle standing. I'm so glad he wiped it out in 70 AD because it would distract people. Here's one of the interesting facts is that the moment Jesus died and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven and sent the Holy Spirit, God did not trumpet from heaven, don't obey the law anymore. He didn't trumpet that. He gave them time to transition out of it. So you'll see a few things that they were a little uncertain. They're uncertain about this. They were so uncertain that people were getting saved. Gentiles were getting saved and filled with the Spirit. And, and the question amongst the Jews who were already saved were, do, we need to, do they need to keep the law of Moses? Do we need to circumcise these people? They're like, I don't know. Do we need to circumcise them? We got to circumcise them. I don't know. I don't know. Well, they didn't know. They had a huge question as all this glory stuff was happening. Do they get circumcised? I don't know. The law of Moses. We got the, we got the law of Moses. They got, to teach, they got to follow the law of Moses to be good Christians. They're like, you know, we're not sure about the answer. Let's send a couple guys over to the, to the headquarters in Jerusalem. Acts chapter 15 describes all this. Let's send them over there and let's find out. So they went and talked to the headquarters. James, the apostle, the brother of Jesus, and all the apostles that were there, they had a meeting. And they decided by the Holy Spirit, they said, it seemed good to us and the Holy Spirit, let's not put any of the law on the Gentiles. Except these four necessary things. Make sure they stop fornicating. Because you know how them Gentiles are. <laughs> like this is the first command they need to know is stop, stop fornicating, you know, it's... That's one of the things you're going to have to realize. No, no, no sex outside of the marriage. Uh, and then let's, because there's Jews everywhere, this is what they said, because there's Jews everywhere, because Moses is preached in every place, and you got Jews everywhere, let's, let's have them be considerate when they're eating things. Don't eat things strangled, things offered to idols, or don't eat the blood. Like, don't eat medium rare around the Jews. They, they think that's the worst sin of all. You follow me? They said, this is it. This is all the Gentiles need to know. And it was because there was Jews everywhere. I would say it this way. If you're eating with an Orthodox Jew today or tonight or tomorrow or in your Christianity, uh, order your food cooked medium well. Or better yet, just order whatever they order. Why? So they don't stumble at your Christianity. You're, you're trying to lead them to the Lord. You're trying, to, you're trying to get them to believe in Jesus, the Messiah. So don't do anything silly that would cause them to stumble. But that was a big deal. This whole idea, Jews versus Gentiles, was a big deal in the early church. Okay? The problem that I'm concerned about for 20 years now is that Christians get gloriously saved, filled with the Spirit, serving God, loving Jesus, healing the sick, casting out devils, fired up to win souls and do all the things of God and learn who they are in Christ. And then, then after several years, they kind of get a little bored or something. I don't know. And they drift back and they're like, huh. We should, put, we should put a little golden menorah candlesticks in our church. Why would you do that? Uh, listen, I realize some of you have golden menorahs <laughs> at your house. <clears throat> I get it, I get it. Uh, look at Galatians 5. Are you in Galatians? Look at Galatians 5. Just let me try to hammer this in so you're not mad at me. <laughs> Galatians 5, verse 1. Now, he's talking about liberty uh, and bondage. Bondage was the law of Moses. That's the context here. He's not talking about sin. In this passage, he's not talking about sin being the bondage. He's talking about the law. Galatians 5, 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with a yoke of bondage. Indeed, I, Paul, say to you that if you become circumcised, Christ will profit you nothing. And I testify again to every man who becomes circumcised that he's a debtor to keep the whole law. 
You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. Stop there. You see how Paul felt? Paul the apostle got the revelation from God that circumcision and law was over, completely over. There's no need to dabble in it. We should not be toying with Jewish feasts ever. It'll start to taint. It says Christ will profit you nothing. Why would he, why would it be okay to mess with Jewish feasts, which were part of the law, if we didn't mess with circumcision, which was the beginning of the whole law or the beginning of the whole covenant? I'm almost done. But y'all are so quiet, I must continue. Uh, Christians try to straddle, straddle the line between, and not just Christians, but, but even believing Jews try to straddle the line between Christianity and Judaism. We call them Messianic. If a Jew gets saved, we, some people call them Messianic Jews. I don't see that term. Do you see that term? Anywhere in the Bible. No, if you believe in Jesus, you're a believer. If you believe in Jesus, you're a disciple of Christ. If you believe in Jesus, you're a Christian. I don't see Messianic Jew anywhere. That's a way to distinguish Judaism or Jewish inside Christianity. There's no need to do that. There's no such thing as a Messianic Jew. Some people call them spiritual Jews or completed Jews. Those are just fancy terms that people come up with to try to keep their Jewishism along with their Christianity. No, 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 no. Listen, Paul the Apostle taught us away from this. He said, listen, if you want to compare how how, your clout in the earth, I more. I was a Jew among Jews. I was a Pharisee. I was trained. I was, from my youth, I kept the law. I was better than everybody. I was more zealous than all my peers. He said, and I count all of that rubbish that that I may be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. Paul counted it rubbish. There is no reason for any Christian, any believer in Jesus, to try to keep their heritage of Jewishism. I'm not mad at Jews. I'm, 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 a, little, I'm a little concerned about Christians trying to go backward. Uh, th- then you actually have non-Jews who are buying into this. Non-Jews are trying to convert to Messianic Judaism. They call them Messianic Gentiles. This is ludicrous, okay? If, listen, listen, I know you're sitting there thinking, why does the pastor have to harp on something like this? I have a feeling if Paul the apostle were here today, he'd be doing the same thing and probably longer. There's no such thing as a Messianic Gentile. That would be a Christian. And you'll see them. You'll see non-Jews converting to Judaism, Christian non-Jews converting to Judaism, wearing the garb, trying to, wearing the hat, wearing, trying to turn Christians toward feast days and all this stuff and, and meeting on the Saturday because uh, that's the true Shabbat and blah, blah, blah. That's garbage. That's garbage. How can I say it nicely? Did I say it nicely? That's, that's garbage. That's okay. That's unscriptural. That's very unscriptural. I don't know. I wish I could be nice all the time. Uh, you, you've got, you've got uh, Christians trying to find out if they're part Jewish, so that they can have the double blessing. Like if you're a Jew that gets saved, you have a double blessing. I'm Jewish and Christian, double blessing. I've heard spirit-filled preachers say that, and I almost threw up in my mouth. There's no such thing as a double blessing. You being Jewish means nothing. It means nothing. I'm part French. It means nothing. In spiritual matters, it means absolutely nothing. There is no Jew nor Gentile in Christ. There's all, we're all the same. Thank you, Lord. 
There, there's people trying to see if they're, they're part of the lost tribe of Israel. Apparently there's a lost tribe of Israel that didn't get to, they got scattered and they, they're the tribe that didn't get to get put back yet. So they're trying to find out who's the lost tribe of Israel. And, and then there's all this, it's actually a cult that's the people that decided they're part of the lost tribe. It's a cult and it leads to arrogance and it leads to demonic obsession and possession. I've seen Christian, I've seen, seen spirit filled Christians get off track personally get off track and turn totally ridiculous in their life. Back to sin, really back to sin in the world with their little badge of pride. <clears throat> the, uh, in the scripture, you'll read this at some point as you read the Bible. The Jews, Paul said this, he said, is there any advantage being a Jew? He said, yeah, yeah, chiefly because the oracles of God was committed to them. Yeah, in the beginning, the Jews had a great advantage. In the beginning, Jews were the only ones to know anything about God. Right. The Jews got saved first. They're the ones that got the word of God. They're the ones that pinned the word of God. They were the first apostles. They were the only apostles. So yeah, in the beginning, it was coming out of Judaism or com coming out of the old covenant. Sure, the Jews had a great advantage. Now there's no more advantage. Right. We're all the same all. in Christ. The same. And Paul's revelation Thank took some time to get to the church. God the Lord Jesus entrusted Paul and the other apostles in explaining to the church these, these very important matters. Why? So that we focus on the Holy Spirit. Amen. Once I have the Holy Spirit, I don't need all your little things, all your little games, all your little toying around with Old Testament symbols. I got the real deal. Right. Amen. All the fakes, all that stuff is fake. Compared to Christ, it's all fake. Right. Compared to a life with the Holy Spirit, all that Old Testament ceremonial stuff, including the calendar, is fake. It was all designed to point to Christ. Right. Now we got the real deal. Glory. Glory. It's, like, it's like, look, for nine months, mothers are going through a, a, an ordeal with expectancy. That's a big deal. Those nine months are a big deal until the baby's born. Then it's all about the baby. Forget the nine months. I got the baby. Finally got the baby. Let's just have fun with the baby. Forget the nine months. Or we can say it's like going on vacation. For three months leading up to the vacation, man, it's the oh, You do all sorts of stuff. Oh, and you're talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. Once the vacation comes, forget those three months. You move on, don't you? Once you got the real deal, it's all about the real deal. Once you got the new covenant, forget the old. Forget the old. 